You'll have to excuse me, I'm a little frazzled. I haven't had my spirit in a body in 500 years. And thankfully the Lord let me be in a slimmer version of the body I had 500 years ago. But, oh, excuse me, I probably should introduce myself. I'm Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King Jr. He was the civil rights leader. I was way before him. And your pastor asked me to come today to talk to you about what happened through my life and the way that God used me to literally transform Christianity and the way that things are done in the modern world. And I need to say right off the bat that it was only by God's grace that He used me in the way that He did. For I was far from perfect. I had many flaws. I said things that I to this day regret. In my zeal, in my fervor, in my passion, and in just the personality that God gave me, sometimes things didn't come out the way I wish they had in looking back. And you know, you have this modern thing called the internet now, and go ahead and Google weird quotes from Martin Luther, things that he said against the Jews and the Muslims, and I regret some of many of those things. But let's put that aside for a moment. I I guess I should probably inform you a little bit about what the world was like that I grew up in. For I was born in 1483, and I was nine years old when Christopher Columbus discovered America. Uh, Modern inventions such as the printing press, very significant. About 50 years before I came on the scene, the printing press had been invented. You see, before the printing press, the only way you could get literature out was by copying books or copying the Latin Vulgate or the Bible. And so, if the church saw something being written that they didn't like, they would squelch it quickly. But with the printing press, all of a sudden, you could write a book. You could write a pamphlet, a track, and it could be mass-produced and have a huge impact on the world. Now let me back up a little bit more about what was the state of the church at the time in which I came on the scene. Well, uh, your pastor spoke and preached, I hear, and you know, I must say, you're you're blessed to have a pastor who preaches through books of the Bible, I might add. He he preached through the book of Acts, uh, I guess about a year ago, I heard, and, and you learned in that series that this wonderful organism called the Church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, formed after Jesus came, died, rose again, and ascended to heaven, and left His Holy Spirit to indwell all His people. And that church began to form. And you read about that in Acts 2. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, to the breaking of bread, and that the Holy Spirit was doing signs and wonders, and that they went from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth as they knew it, and the church was growing, and the church was flourishing, and it was very organic. It was these bodies of believers. They would meet in homes. Or they would meet in the temple. Or they would meet in a bigger home. Or they'd have to break out of homes and build bigger spaces as the church grew. And it was this vibrant organism filled with the Holy Spirit. And people's lives were being changed. And it was all about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. For 300 years, this was what the church looked like. Flourishing, organic, growing, meeting here and there and everywhere. And then something happened in Rome. The leader of Rome in the 4th century, Constantine, supposedly became a Christian. I have my doubts. And uh, all of a sudden, he made Christianity the state religion. He formalized everything. He wedded the state with this organism And shall we say, things began to deteriorate. They began to build these big edifices, buildings and shrines and ornamentalness and and it just began to really disintegrate. And the church became more formal and more structured and you had these leaders and you had priests and you had this one person called a pope who, who it evolved into this whatever he said it had to be God and you couldn't disagree with him or you're disagreeing with God and if you disagreed with anything that the church says you were excommunicated you were burned at the stake and they squelched any opposition very quickly 
So from the 4th century until about the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century, this was what the church looked like. And you need to understand, this was the only church in the sense of it was the Roman Catholic Church or it was nothing. I mean, the Eastern Orthodox Church, 1100s, but I'm talking about Western Europe that I was born into. It was the Roman Catholic Church or it was nothing. Now, now let me say this. I was not the first that God used to begin to speak out against things that were unbiblical. I must give credit where credit is due. For there were people like John Huss. There were people like Peter Waldo. John Wycliffe. In the 13 and 1400s that were beginning to see that what the Bible taught and what the church was doing were not consistent. But as I said, this was pre-printing press. Their speaking out was squelched very quickly and very suddenly and very finally. John Huss is probably my favorite of the pre-reformers. John Huss was saying some of the very things that I was going to say a hundred years later. And when John Huss was burned at the stake, he made a prophecy that is stunning to this day to me even. You see, the word Huss in Bohemian, he was Bohemian, meant goose. And, they, and he said this, as he was about to be burned at the stake, you are about to cook the goose, but in 100 years will come an eagle who will fly that you will not be able to stop. It was 102 years after he said that that I nailed the 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church. For I was that eagle by the grace of God, despite my imperfections. May it be known to every one of you today that God can use you despite your imperfections. I'm not excusing sin. I'm not excusing the flesh. I'm not excusing carnality. But I am here to say that God looks at your heart. And God looks at your passion. And God looks at you standing on His Word. And He can use every one of you even if you are imperfect like I very much was. So that's the background of the world I came into. A structured, formal, organized church that in many ways had drifted from true biblical Christianity. All right, I was born in 1483 in Germany. I was blessed with a very good education. My dad wanted me to be a lawyer, and I was on that track. But at the age of 22, I was almost struck by lightning, and I made a vow to St. Anne. If I survive, I will become a monk. Well, I survived, and I fulfilled that vow. I became an Augustinian monk. And as I was living in the monastery, and monks are those who pledge themselves to never be married and devote themselves solely to God in the study of His Word and prayer and fasting and penance and, and ritual. And so I went at it with all my heart, body, soul, spirit. I fasted. I prayed. I figured you have to confess your sin to be forgiven. You have to realize your sin to confess your sin to be forgiven. And so for sometimes up to six hours a day, I would confess my sin to the priest. And I would leave the confessional and I would say, oh, I just had another impure thought. And I would come back and confess again and again. I irritated the priest so much that finally he said, Martin, before you come back, why don't you commit a big sin like adultery or murder? He got so frustrated at my confessing endlessly and over and over. But let me tell you this, and I wrote this in my journal. I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. (laughs) All my brothers in the monastery who knew me will bear me out. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, readings, and other work. None of these efforts brought me peace. I found myself not loving God, but hating God. For being so difficult to reach, at least I thought. I prayed and studied and worked and did all the rituals required of me and yet had no joy or peace. The harder I tried, the further I felt from God. 
Can you relate? Can you relate? Maybe you're trying to get to God by your good works, your ritual, your piousness, your performance, your goodness. I was miserable. The very thing that you would think would make one feel close to God. Devoting his entire life to prayer, confession, meditation, chanting, saying all the things you're supposed to do. So my church told me it was yielding no peace. I was miserable. At 29, I had earned my doctorate and became a full professor of theology at Wittenberg University where I taught and helped to pastor. And it was there that my mentor gave me wise counsel in putting me in a position where I was now focusing on others, not so much myself, teaching the Word, not so much in this high introspection of my own sin. And it was there that I was given the task, the sovereignty of God is all over this, (laughs) to teach the book of Psalms. I heard your pastor just preached on that recently. Man, what a wise man. But I was preaching through Psalms, and there I came to Psalm 22. The very passage that our Lord recited from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it was there that the spark of the love of God began to be lit that would eventually grow into a fire. For I saw in that passage that our Lord was separated from His Father because our sins were put on Him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then I was given the task of preaching through Romans. Sovereignty of God. And it was in teaching through the book of Romans that my eyes were opened and my heart was receptive. And I saw in Romans this marvelous teaching called justification by faith. It's in Romans 1, it's in Romans 2, it's in Romans 3, it's really in Romans 4, it's in Romans 5. And I wrote in my journal this, as a monk I had led an irreproachable life. Nevertheless, I felt that I was a sinner before God. My conscience was restless and I could not depend on God being propitiated by my satisfactions. Not only did I not love, but I actually hated the righteous God who punished sinners. Thus, a furious battle raged within my perplexed conscience. But meanwhile, I was knocking at the door of this particular passage in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Day and night, I pondered. Until I saw the connection between the justice of God in the statement, the just shall live by faith. Then I grasped the truth. That the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy... He justifies us by faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of Scripture took on a new meaning. Whereas before the righteousness of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. Thus, the passage of Paul became to me a gateway to heaven. If you have true faith in Christ as your Savior, I wrote this in my journal, it's now available for anyone to read. Thank God for the printing press. If you put your faith in Christ as your Savior, then at once you have a gracious God. For faith leads you in and opens up God's heart and will that you should see pure grace and overflowing love. (laughs) Thus it is to behold God in faith that you should look upon His fatherly, friendly heart in which there is no anger nor ungraciousness. He who sees God as angry does not see Him rightly, but looks only on a curtain as if a dark cloud had been drawn across His face. (laughs) Oh, the joy of salvation! My soul is set free. I finally understood that it is a gift. Christ paid it all. He took your sin. He took my sin. He paid the full price for my redemption. All I have to do is receive the gift. 
put my trust in Christ alone for my salvation. It is not by my works. It is not by my piety. It is not by my confession of sins. It is by the grace of God alone. And my receiving that by faith. My soul was set free. I was converted. Fully converted. Born again. And oh, did this change the course of my life and the course of human history. Just like your salvation and your obedience to God can change the course of human history. Never discount how God might use you. Now having this experience, you can imagine what followed was quite interesting. For I began to grow in my understanding of the Word of God. I began to grow in my understanding of salvation and the cross and this organism called the church that God wanted to have. And then I looked at the church of which I was a part, again, which was the only church there was, and there was great conflict. For I saw the decision of popes and councils that were not in line with the Scriptures. I saw them changing things at a will, at a whimmer, to suit their own purposes. And this troubled me deeply. This was the church I loved. It's the only church I knew. I mean, you guys, if you have trouble here, you can go down the street to another one. (laughs) I didn't have that option. There was no other It was the Roman Catholic Church or it was excommunication and hell, so they would say. I had discovered a relationship with God, not religion and ritual. I had discovered justification by faith instead of works and striving. And you might call it like the, you know what an iceberg is. There's the tip of the iceberg, which you see, And then there's a deeper aspect of the iceberg that's below the surface that not everyone can see. Well, the tip of the iceberg in the early 1500s was a teaching and a practice called indulgences. Pope Leo X was in charge and he wanted to finish St. Peter's Cathedral. He had this huge building project and he didn't have much money. And so the church came up with this idea of indulgences. What are indulgences? Basically the church said that you can pay money to get the forgiveness of your sins. Who wouldn't want that? Sins are what's going to send us to hell, right? Furthermore, there was a teaching called purgatory. It was the belief that no one was good enough for heaven... And maybe no one bad enough for hell. And so when you die, you go to this in-between place called purgatory. And you need to have your sins purged before you can get to heaven. So you need to work off the ability to purge your sins. But better yet, if you have somebody still alive who prays for you and pays some money to the church, then you could help your dead relative get out of purgatory. How good is that? I mean, you love your, your mother who died, right? And you want to help your mother who died and gave so much to you. So if you just give some money to the church, and, 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 and Pope Leo X hired this guy named John Tetzel. Oh, John Tetzel was a great marketer. He would have been very successful with an Amazon or something today. For he went around and he sold these indulgences. And he had this little saying, very popular in my day. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings... Another soul in purgatory springs. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, another soul in purgatory springs. So you can help your dead relative and your own self by paying this money to the church and thus have your sins forgiven and help your relatives that are in purgatory. This troubled me deeply. This infuriated me. For the church that I love, but I love God more, there was a contradiction. Now back in the day that I lived, 
posting something on the door of the church was a way to get the word out. It was like a bulletin board. You guys have this sophisticated internet thing now, and it's awesome. You know, you can post something, and it can go all over the world in a moment. Well, our way of doing that back then was the door of the church. And let me make this very, very, very clear. It was never my intention to start a new movement. It was my intention to bring reform to the Catholic Church. And I am not here bashing Catholicism. I'm not anti-Catholic. I love all churches that seek to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. In my day, again, it was the only church there was. I wanted to bring reform to the church that I loved. God had another plan. We'll get to that in a minute. But it was October 31st, 1517. Two days from now, 500 years earlier. That's why you're celebrating the 500th anniversary of the protestant (laughs) reformation today. And all over the world, churches are doing this. What happened on October 31st, 1517 was I had written what is called the 95 Theses. And you can read all about them, but the bullseye of these 95 theses that I nailed to the church that day in hopes of getting a discussion going. That was my motive. It was to get a discussion going with the leaders and others to say, let's talk about this. There's things happening that are not biblical. Let's bring change. We've drifted. Let's come back to what the Word of God says. And I posted these on the door. And most of them, not all of them, but most of them had to do with indulgences. And one of the things that I said, I don't remember what number it was, but I said, you know, just logically think this through, everybody. If the Pope has the power to forgive sins and get people out of purgatory, why doesn't he, out of love, get everyone out of purgatory? (laughs) I mean, it's just logical, wasn't it? Well... As you can imagine, ah, the church didn't think very fondly of what I was doing. (laughs) Not at all. But my writings began to circulate. They began to circulate widely because of the printing press. The 95 Theses, other pamphlets I was writing, insights into Scripture, into Romans, into justification by faith. And for three years, I was basically put on trial in various settings. Arguments and, and, and going back and forth with, with the leaders of, of my church. And, and then it all culminated in 1521 at an event called the Diet of Worms. Now it's... Spelled in English, diet of worms, <laughs> but you pronounce the W as a V, and it's not a diet like you deal with food. Matter of fact, if you went on a diet of worms, you would lose a lot of weight if you're only eating worms. It wasn't that at all. You see, a diet was like a, 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 a trial. It was a discussion, but I was put on trial. It was in Worms, Germany. Famous event, 1521 they laid all of my writings out on a table and they said will you recant to recant means to say I disown all this I wrote it but I don't believe it now I'm changing my mind and they were calling me to recant and everyone especially me knew that if I did not recant it would mean death For I had heard of John Huss, I knew of others that had been burned at the stake. Now lest you imagine me as this perfectly bold, never struggling in my faith, always firm and steadfast, I want to read to you part of the prayer that I prayed that night. Because when they called me to recant, I said, Let me give you an answer tomorrow. And I went back to my quarters. And I sought the Lord and I wrote the following prayer and I prayed this. O God, Almighty God, everlasting, how dreadful is this world. Behold how its mouth opens to swallow me up. How small is my faith in Thee. Oh, the weakness of this flesh. The power of Satan. 
If I am to depend upon my strength in this world, then all is over. Oh God, oh God, oh Thou my God, help me against the wisdom of this world. Do this, I beseech Thee. The work is not mine, but Thine. I have nothing to contend for with these great men of the world. I would gladly pass my days in happiness and peace, but the cause is Thine. And it is righteous and everlasting. O oh Lord, help me! O oh, faithful and unchangeable God, I lean not upon man. If I did, it would be in vain. Whatever is of man is tottering. Whatever proceeds from him must fail. My God, my God, dost thou not hear? My God, art thou no longer living? Thou dost but hide thyself from me. I felt so in this wrestling match. Thou hast chosen me for this work. I know it, therefore, O oh God. Accomplish thine own will. Forsake me not for the sake of thy well-beloved Son, Jesus Christ, my defense, my buckler, and my stronghold. Lord, where art thou? My God, where art thou? Come, I pray thee, I'm ready. I'm ready, behold, I'm prepared to lay down my life for thy truth. Suffering like a lamb, for the cause is holy, it is thine own. I will not let thee go, no, nor yet for all eternity. And though the world should be thronged with devils, and this body which is the work of thine hands should be cast forth, trodden underfoot, cut in pieces, consumed to ashes, my soul is thine. Yes, I have thy own word to assure me of it. My soul belongs to Thee and will abide with Thee forever. Amen, O oh God. Send help. Amen. The next day I stood before the council and once again was given the opportunity to recant. And Then it's the famous quote that many of you have heard. Until I am convinced from Scripture and sound reason that what I have said is contrary to God's Word, I will not recant. Here I stand. So help me God. Here I stand. So help me God. Because they could not show that what I taught was contrary to the Word of God. And I had to stand upon what God's Word said even though it went against the only church I knew. For God's Word stands forever. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. His truth endureth forever. And you sang that great hymn that I wrote this morning. You sang it. And I said, mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark, never failing. And I was condemned and excommunicated. Remember, it was never my intention to leave the church I loved. I had hoped and prayed that I could bring reformation within my church, but they would have nothing to do with me. It was even the Pope who declared after that diet that once Martin gets home, if someone kills him, they will not be punished. The Pope himself. Once he gets home, let him get home. And then anybody who kills him, there will be no consequences. I had some good friends that knew that this was the outcome and they quickly took me and hid me away protected me and I would say of all the things that God gave me the grace to do for if you read books today honestly there have been miss many written this is probably my favorite <laughs> Eric Metaxas he wrote the one on Bonhoeffer the man who rediscovered God and changed the world he did amazing research on me and points out that I read through the entire Bible twice a year, every year. He says, I don't know if I was, he says I was the most, if not the most, one of the most brilliant minds in Western Europe of the time. But you know, you talk about the sovereignty of God and some of you are going through tough times and you maybe feel like you're all hid away and isolated and in a season of desert, let's say. 
I can tell you this, no matter what difficulty you face, no matter how much you suffer, and I suffered a lot, I, he writes about it, I had a lot of physical issues, intestinal problems, ringing in my ears, headaches, depression, I had it all. Lost two children. We'll get to that in a minute. But one thing I discovered is that if you hold fast to God, if you cling to His Word, no matter what comes your way, God can work His purposes. So when I was put into hiding by my friends, and I'm humbled to, to share this, but it's just the fact, I translated the entire New Testament into German in 11 weeks. In 11 weeks, I took not the Latin Vulgate, The Bible of the day was the Latin Vulgate, which hardly anybody knew Latin. You had to trust in the authority of church leaders to interpret it for you. But I was given Erasmus's Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. I took the Greek New Testament. By the grace of God, I had the ability to know Greek and Hebrew. And I translated from the Greek, not the Latin Vulgate, the New Testament into the German language in 11 weeks. So for the first time, my people could have God's Word in their language. And to this day, it was about 10, 12, 13 years later that I and others, I had the help of others, completed the entire Bible <laughs> into German. And this on this shelf here, your pastor's grandmother gave him this. It's a 1788 copyright of my 1534 Bible, the German Bible. It's right here. You can come look at it afterwards, but I'd like a few of the security people to please guard it so that no one takes it. <laughs> but right here is the... And this is the translation they use today in Germany. They still regard this as the best translation. The Word of God. In the common language of the people. And able to be mass produced because of this amazing thing that God sovereignly oversaw called the printing press. And by the way, it was after this was completed, it was three years later, in 1525, the first English Bible was translated by William Tyndale. <laughs> he got a copy of my New Testament in 1522. And this led to his translating it into English. You have a copy of the Bible in your lap probably this morning. Never take it for granted. Never take it for granted. And so from there, God protected me physically. Others began to rediscover the essence of the gospel, the essence of the church. And what happened, listen closely, what happened from that point was this movement. I never imagined it would take place this way. But God in His sovereignty, so many began to rediscover these truths and the gospel and then getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, many began to break away from the Catholic Church, and they began to form these new movements. And that's why today you have non-denominational churches, Lutheran churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, Church of God, Holiness churches, Pentecostal churches, and on and on. And I know some people say all these different denominations, but I'm telling you what, they each express the gospel in different ways and reach different people. I think it's marvelous. That's the Protestant Reformation. It was a protest against unbiblical teaching. It was a reformation, reforming that which was originally there by God in the book of Acts. And that's why you are now a part of this. You're a part of this. This is how it happened. And it spread from Western Europe to Eastern Europe and even to places like the United States. And now it's all over the world. Is the church perfect? Of course not. Is there a need for new modern reformations? You bet. And maybe some of you will be inspired today to, to walk in my shoes to take the mantle of reformation to speak out against things that are done today in the church that are not biblical. Maybe today there's things you see that are just done by tradition, but it's really not biblical and it's not effective. Maybe there's a need today for a new reformation. Could it be that you would be a reformer? 
Maybe it won't be as on the grandest scale that, that mine was, but maybe it's in your home. Maybe it's in your workplace. Maybe it's in your college campus. Maybe it's in your city. Maybe it is in your nation. Oh, how I believe we need a new reformation. So let me conclude by giving you the three major truths, teachings, that really came forth from this reformation of which I had the privilege of being a part of. The first is the supremacy of Scripture versus church tradition. You see, what I had to stand on was, is this the final authority? Or do I trust in what a church has done and what man has done and what popes and councils and tradition says? You see, let me say, if tradition goes against this, I'm going to stay with this. <laughs> Never fail to see the final authority is God and His Word. All Scripture is inspired by God, 2 Timothy 3.16, and it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness. That the man and woman of God might be adequately equipped for every good work. Stand on the Word, beloved. Oh, beloved, stand on the Word. The Word is your life. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Bible says that the Word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the way to combat Satan. It's the way to advance the kingdom. It's the way to have your heart purified. It's that which your doctrine must be based upon, the Word of God. The supremacy of the Word as opposed to church tradition or the teachings of man. Always evaluate what your pastor teaches. Is it in line with Scripture? Be like the Bereans who examine daily the things that Paul said to see if they were in accordance with God's Word. So the first was the supremacy of Scripture versus tradition. The second hallmark of the Reformation was justification by faith as opposed to works. I've explained that pretty adequately, I believe, that so many like me were striving and straining to be good enough for God by their good works, by their behavior, by their piety, by their confessions, by their rituals. Oh, the joy and the freedom when you discover that everything that separates you from your God was put on Jesus at the cross. He took everything that can separate you from your Creator. He paid it all. He fully bore your sin, my sin. And it's by simple faith trust receiving the gift of righteousness that we are given the very righteousness of God Almighty. So when He looks at you, He sees the righteousness of Jesus. If you've received Christ, you are clean in His sight. And it's not based on anything you do. It's based on everything He did. The righteousness of God given to you. Oh, that that would give you joy. Oh, that that would give you freedom. Oh, that that would set you free to be the person God's created you to be. Justification by grace. Through faith alone. In Christ alone. It's not on the basis of your works. This may be an area that needs a new reformation today. For I have talked to your pastor and I've talked to many who do evangelism on the college campuses today and many who are even raised in what you would think are good Protestant churches today still believe they're saved by works. You ask them the question, if you were to stand before God and He were to say, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? And I mean, these are good Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and Pentecostals that you would think they got the gospel, but they still will give an answer kind of like this. Well, I've tried pretty hard to be a good person. And I go to church, and I give money, and, and, and I'm involved in charitable activities, and these are works. These are appealing to things you do. It's, it's not on the basis of what you do. Do you understand that? It's justification by faith in Christ alone. It's what He did. It's what He did. All you have to do is receive it. You heard my story. You saw how I tried so hard to be good enough for God. And it was, it was so unpeaceful. It was only when I discovered that I had to receive it by faith. It was already done for me by God. Justification by faith is the second. 
hallmark of the Reformation. And then thirdly, and it stems out of the second one, the priesthood of all believers. What does that mean? Well, again, in my day, you had popes and you had priests and it was the church leaders. They were the ones that you had to kind of go through to get to God, either because of confession or whatnot, but it was this, it was this hierarchy. You had the priest, the church leaders, and then you had the laity. I'm just a lay person. You know, this like there's this difference. They're more holy. They're closer to God. They can serve God. But we're just the lowly people down here. We're second class Christians. No! No! Look, listen to the Word of God. You are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for His own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And so, what we did is we rediscovered that all people are equal before God. And that if you're born again, and if you have the Holy Spirit, you're a priest. A priest is one who can come into the presence of God, and you can do that through the blood of Jesus. You can come boldly to God. You don't have to go through a human mediator. <laughs> you don't have to go through some human leader. You don't have to go to Pastor Jimmy or, 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 or any other Pastor Kevin here to get to God. You can go directly to God. You know, that sounds so, maybe you're, maybe you're so familiar with that, you take it for granted. That was a new concept to so many in my day. Furthermore, not only can you come directly to God, you can serve God wherever you are. And there's been many writings about what I said regarding vocation. Because I believe so strongly that no matter your vocation, whether you work for the city, whether you're a garbage collector, whether you're a lawyer, a teacher, a, a, a mother, I have this famous quote that a man who changes his baby's diapers, it's an act of worship. Because I believe that everything one does when they're walking with God is an act of worship. And everything you do is significant to God. You can serve Him right where you are. You can be His hands and His feet. You can be His representatives. People don't have to go to the church to find God. You represent God wherever you are and wherever you go. The priesthood of all believers. And that was one of the things that empowered people to do what they did that led to so many of these different churches and movements just being resurrected and, and, and growing and flourishing because they understood that they have the Holy Spirit. And if you're in Christ today, you have the Holy Spirit. You're a priest of Almighty God. Oh, I wish we had time to talk more. But I'm sensing the Father calling me back. And so I must go. I, I wish I had time to talk more about things such as music which your worship leader spoke of today many give me credit for congregational singing maybe I was, maybe I wasn't, but I believe this I believed that next to the Bible the greatest way to communicate theology was music and I wrote hymns and others did and, and people began to sing in church before they didn't do that, they just sat passively and listened to these chants which they didn't even understand and people began to feel, be filled with joy and they began to sing to the Lord we rediscovered the Psalms and how much music is in the Bible. Oh, I wish I had time to talk about marriage and the family. Yes, I got married. <laughs> married a former nun. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure that. <laughs> actually, I know this is going to sound a little weird, but I actually helped some nuns escape from the nunnery because I believed that they were being kept against their will, and they were. They kept these girls from the age of five and made them nuns, and they didn't want to be nuns. And I said, that's an offense to God. And so I helped some nuns escape, and we were helping them find husbands, and one was mine. <laughs> I became the husband to Catherine, and we had six children. Woo! Because <laughs> I believed that sex was a gift from God. I did. I wrote about it. <laughs> but uh, uh, as you can tell, I was quite a character in my day. <laughs> but two of those children died. My 12-year-old daughter, I held her in my arms when she breathed her last. We lost another one at infancy. I know suffering. I know suffering. I know spiritual warfare. I write about that a lot. I know there's that story about me throwing the inkwell in the place because I was supposedly throwing an inkwell at Satan. Let me clarify that. Because if you go to the place where that happened, the tour guide will make sure he rubs a little stuff on the wall to make it look like there's still ink there. Well, my point was this. We fight the devil with ink. Writing. Writing books. Writing pamphlets. Writing tracts. Writing music that are filled with truth. I didn't literally throw an inkwell at Satan. I said we fight Satan with ink. 
by writing things that can go out and set people free. Because the truth will set you free. So justification by faith, the supremacy of Scripture, and the priesthood of all believers. Don't lose sight of those truths. I preached justification by faith every Sunday to my church because I knew they would forget it quickly. Don't forget it. Hold fast to God's Word. Are you in God's Word every day? Are you holding to the truth of Scripture? Never take your Bible for granted. Never, ever, ever. God gave His Word to give you encouragement and truth and to set you, you know, anything you need, anything you need for life and godliness. It's by His Spirit and it's in His Word. Oh, I know i got to get back. He let me be in this thinner body just for a moment. <laughs> Mine was more robust, trust me. But let me just, one more. If you could only know what I know. If you could only see what I see. To be with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To be with Him in glory. For this present trial is nothing, Romans 8, 18 says, compared to the eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. If you could only see what I know and see in eternity, if you could only be with Him in glory, you would live a different life. Never lose sight of what is eternal. Eternal.